I'm visiting Shooter's Hill in southeast London to take a look at a rather remarkable building. This is Sevendrug Castle, and it's a building with a curious backstory. As you can probably tell, it's not a real castle, it's more of a folly. It was built in 1784 on the orders of one Lady James, in memory of her husband, Commodore William James. According to historical legend, William James was born into poverty as the son of a Welsh ploughman or miller. He was born sometime around 1721, the records aren't clear. His exact origins are a mystery. What we can be sure of is that he was born in fairly humble circumstances, and in the early 1730s he became a sailor. He demonstrated an aptitude for command, and by 1738, when he would have been in his late teens, he was already commanding a ship. In 1747, he was headhunted by the British East India Company. The East India Company is an interesting and complicated, not to say controversial, subject. The company was founded at the end of the 16th century to take advantage of the burgeoning and highly profitable trade in spice. Now at the time, India didn't refer to the country we now know, but rather it was a vague term used to represent the area around South Asia. Over the next couple of centuries, the company expanded rapidly, trading in such diverse cargoes as tea, coffee, cotton, opium, wool, bullion, saltpetre and slaves. Initially trading with the Spice Islands in modern-day Indonesia, they would later trade either directly or indirectly with India, Japan, China, Africa, America, and more or less anywhere that would take them. The company, John Company as it came to be nicknamed, had a force of guards to protect its goods. As the company grew, so too did its military strength. We may think Google has too much power these days, but at least they can't field an army or a navy. John Company had both. In fact, under Charles II, they gained a frankly astonishing amount of autonomy. They were allowed to acquire territory, to govern provinces, to mint their own coin, to make deals with local rulers, and even to fight wars. All of which they did, in the interests of trade. In 1773, the East India Company Act officially recognised them as a de facto instrument of the British Crown. It's impossible to discuss the history of the British Empire without John Company looming large. In fact, in the context of this video, British and East India Company are practically interchangeable. Of course, the company didn't operate unopposed. They had to deal with rivals from Portugal, France and the Netherlands, and of course the native peoples of the lands in which they operated who weren't too happy about all these sunburnt Englishmen marching around like they owned the place. So it was that they came to fall foul of the Maratha Empire. The Maratha Empire controlled a substantial portion of the Indian subcontinent and could field a formidable navy. European nations trading in India came to fear and respect the Maratha fleet under Admiral Kanoji Angre, which carried out several successful raids on their ships. Different countries developed different strategies, but most decided that the simplest course of action was just to avoid Kanoji. That was the strategy adopted by the French and the Dutch. The Portuguese negotiated peace. That left the British to bear the brunt of Kanoji's anger. Kanoji's stepson, Tuleji, continued his father's legacy and became an even bigger thorn in the company's side. On one occasion, he engaged a flotilla of no fewer than 36 vessels. This was not a man to be messed with lightly. However, Tuleji was something of a renegade. Kanoji had been subordinate to the Peshwa, the political leader of the Maratha Empire. Tuleji, on the other hand, had no interest in serving the Peshwa, and informed him that if he wished to negotiate, he could, to quote a contemporary report, address himself to Tuleji's private parts. By 1754, Tuleji and the Maratha Empire were at war. Despite their previous animosity, the Maratha Empire recognised that in Tuleji they had a common enemy with Britain, and so they formed an alliance against the man they saw as a dangerous pirate king. Tuleji's base was the fortress of Severnadurg. Severnadurg is built on a rocky island off the west coast of India. 
Its walls were partly carved out of the natural stone and it was protected by an estimated 134 guns. On the seaward side, the walls were up to 18 feet thick. The sea on the landward side was dangerously shallow for any attacking fleet, and the mainland boasted three more forts to make things even more difficult. It was considered by many observers to be impregnable. The planned solution the Allies came up with was to besiege the place, with the British taking charge of the naval side and the Maratha army carrying out the actual invasion. William James was in charge of the British fleet at Severnaderg. At the start of the campaign in 1755, he had only four ships. He had been promised backup from the Royal Navy base at Madras, but it was slow to arrive. James was not a patient man and decided to get started anyway. After a futile attack on the seaward side, he decided to take the risk and sail his ship, the Protector, around to the landward side. In places there was just a foot of water between the keel and the seabed. The Protector and two bomb catches now lay between four forts and began shelling. The Protector was so close to the main fortress that it couldn't even make use of all its guns, instead relying heavily on sharpshooters in the rigging. It was an extremely risky strategy but one that eventually, incredibly, won the day. It seemed that in James, the audacious Tulagy had finally met his match. The taking of Severnaderg was followed by the capture of Geria, but on this occasion the defences weren't as strong, nor was the British fleet as small, so the story isn't as interesting. James' share of the plunder was enough to retire on very comfortably, which he did, moving to the then rural area of Eltham. He was considered a hero by the British, and would be made a baronet and eventually chairman of the East India Company. He died in 1783 of a stroke. Legend has it that this stroke was brought about when he read of the planned East India Company Act, which in 1784 would formally bring all of the company's political activities under the control of the British government. Although other sources say that the stroke happened at his daughter's wedding, so take it as you will. His widow, Anne, Lady James, commemorated him with Seven Drew Castle. Intended as a replica of Suvernadurg, it bears almost no resemblance to the original, being a triangular Gothic tower. The name, too, is an anglicised take on the original. Sadly, it wasn't open to the public at the time of our visit, thank you COVID-19, but it offers excellent views from the top when it is. Thank you for watching. I hope this video has been of interest. If so, then please hit the like button, subscribe and tap the bell icon if you want to see more of my videos about London's curiosities. And I'll see you again very soon. Cheerio!